Hello, I'm Mark Piker from an executive editor of Backstage Magazine, and this is the amazing, wonderful Joe Mantello, Emmy nominated for HBO's The Normal Heart. And not only did Joe earn an Emmy nomination for The Normal Heart, but he also earned a Tony nomination for the Broadway revival a few years ago when he played Dead Weeks. So Joe, tell us about moving. I think I saw it. <laughs> right before we came out here, I found two straight pins in my pocket. And I have no idea what they were doing there. And I thought it was some sort of strange omen. But um, so. Uh, uh, go ahead, what was she saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very ominous question now. Um, what, was the, what was the process of getting involved with the HBO adaptation? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 I think Larry Kramer um, uh, had wanted me to play the role, and um, that took a while. And uh, I don't know, they just asked me. <laughs> so you didn't have to audition? Um, I did not have to audition, no. Would you have auditioned? Uh, sure. Yeah. Were you nervous about, because I saw the Broadway revival, mm -hmm. which was spectacular, and one of those once in a lifetime plays that happened so rarely. One might even say once in a lifetime. Were you nervous about revisiting it? Revisiting the play? Yeah. No, I wasn't nervous about revisiting the play because um, my pal Jim Parsons was there, and um, and I knew Mark um, Ruffalo, and I knew Matt Bomer, um, so no, I would, and I wasn't. You know, people have asked me whether it was strange to be in the scene and watch another actor play a part that I had played, and it really, it really wasn't. I think maybe because I had so much, um, I hadn't. Um, been in a film for many, 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 many years, and and, and and at that time there was only one that I'd done, so it really was like my second film, and uh, <laughs> so I had plenty to think about <laughs> other than what Mark Ruffalo was going to do. Uh, Mark Ruffalo was great. Yeah. Had the rhythms of the play stayed with you? Were you finding yourself hearing? Shadow voices doing the lines as you were filming. Uh, not really. I think this. What, what's so. What I think is so great about the screenplay is that it. it it's kept. Um, it's kept all of the kind of the arias that are in the play and all of the best parts of the play. But it really is its own. Its own other kind of essential document of. Um, you know Larry's world. So no, it was not. Um, no. Did you do any research for Mickey? I met the man uh, that Mickey is based on, uh, Dr. Lawrence Mass. Uh, we um, we went to lunch, and he was fascinating. But we uh, mostly just kind of to get his blessing and um, ask him questions. And he was very open and candid with me. And uh, it was, it's interesting because I think he both reveres Larry, as we all do, hopefully, and and he says he's a really complicated person, and so that kind of, uh, you know, he sort of explained the contradiction from his point of view. It was really helpful. Had you done research for it, Ned, when you were doing that on Broadway? Um, <laughs> you know, the way that it came up, okay, uh, the way that it came about was, uh, we did it as a one-night reading. And um, and uh, someone decided that they wanted to, um, to to try to mount it on Broadway, and so it was always this thing that uh, felt like it was never really going to happen. So by the time it all got into motion and 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 um, they pulled the trigger, you know, we had uh, two weeks of rehearsal, I think four previews, and then we opened. So all of us really tried to show up. We were just too busy learning lines. Um, <laughs> uh, sad to say. Do you normally do research when you're acting? Uh, uh, <laughs> this is so strange because I'm not really an actor. Um, do I do research? No, I don't. Is the answer. <laughs> when do you what do you mean by research? 
Well, for instance, Matt Bomer, when he was with us the other week, flew to Tulsa. They're very ugly. It's <laughs> hideous. It was difficult to get through that one. I'm telling you, I was choking down my bile. Um, but he flew to Tulsa to research where Felix was originally from. I, I am aware of this. We went out to dinner, and he said, I said, so how have you been? He said, uh, and this was maybe May, and he said, I've been working on this since January. And I said, oh, uh, <laughs> what have you been doing? And he said, I rented out this little theater on Santa Monica Boulevard, and I go in there and I work on the part. And I said, Oh, so what do you do? And he said, I just explore the character. And I thought it was so, I had, I thought he blew my mind. I thought it was really, really fascinating. And, you know, you can tell from his performance that it is that, he, it is that embodied, that, that he's lived with that man for a very, very, very long time. And, you know, my feeling about it is you do what you need to do to get you to what you need to, you know, I've worked with lots of actors in rehearsal and, some do lots of research, some some just show up and see what happens. Is it difficult navigating casts comprised of those two types of actors? You know, you try to, in the first couple of days, this is for a play, in the first couple of days, <clears throat> a sort of a hierarchy establishes itself and you understand who the most, um, vivid person in the room is going to be. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know how they want to work. My feeling has always been is that I like to work with actors who come in and have ideas. And I've always said it doesn't have to be my idea, it doesn't have to be your idea, but somebody has to have an idea. I'm not really great with a kind of um, uh, watch this space more to come kind of actor. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? It's like, it's, it becomes very private and I can't do anything until I feel it and so we're all just gonna sit here and wait until you feel like you want to try something. I just, that's just never been, it's never seemed to me the best use of anybody's time. Um, so I tend to like, I like, I like working with Laurie Metcalf and I like working with Nathan Lane and I like working with Leo Schreiber because these are people who come to rehearsal, this is for a play, sorry. Uh, uh, who come to rehearsal for a play and they're prepared and they're ready to go and they dive in and they're always at 100%. And so when you have one of those people in the room, uh, the rest of the, the company can't help but follow suit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you, so Matt Bomer forced you to up your game. No, I wasn't <laughs> in scenes with him, so I <laughs> <laughs> What was filming like? How long were you on set? Uh, we shot. We shot it. In, I don't know if you know this. We shot it in um, two installments. We did five weeks last summer, and then <clears throat> excuse me, and then we were off for about um, two or three months. And Matt and Finn um, lost a considerable amount of weight, and then we came back for about two weeks. So what was it like coming back after that much time away? It was kind of amazing. Um, both the play and the, doing the play and doing the film shared this strange sense, there was this, this extraordinary sense of camaraderie that developed um, and that people left their egos you know, outside and they came to work, but it was also a fucking great time, despite the subject matter. Like we had an amazing time, we had real fun. And for the film I would say that that was really due to um, Mark Ruffalo and the way that he conducts himself on the set. He's an extraordinary man, um, extraordinary actor, and an even better guy. And so, you, you know, he, he really set the tone for all of us. And um, we worked hard, but we also had a good time. As a director of being directed by Ryan Murphy in this instance, is it easy for you to check your directorial instincts and listen to what the director in this instance has to say? Yeah, well, I mean, I think w w w the thing I loved about Ryan, and I did love working with him, is that, um, and this sounds simpler than, it, than I mean it to, but he knew when to say something, but more importantly, he knew when not to say something. And there's a distinction. And, um, and he, would, he knew
knew the exact right moment to come in and say the exact right thing to help. And otherwise, you would kind of, you, you got a sense of, of what you were doing by sort of watching him. It was great. What would he say to you? He was really helpful. I mean, he, I mean, he, he would, I don't remember anything specific, but, uh, you know, um, I have one sort of long monologue in the movie, and we shot it on the last day of the first section, so he was very sensitive that day, and <clears throat> I really don't know that much about the camera and how things are shot, and he kind of took me through how we were going to work it, because we shot it all day. And so he was trying to explain to me about when he was going to need me to go for it, and when we were, when he was just going to, you know, it was going to be, a, you know, like a, a, a shot of the whole room that he was going to use like a second of. And so he, he explained technical things to me that were, you know, outside of my experience. What was that like, having to keep that in your mind while also delivering this huge emotional monologue? Mm, I didn't really keep it. I mean, I just sort of. It was all that was all handheld, so it was it was easier to, think, you know. I mean, we definitely had marks that we had to hit, but um, um, it was nice because again, it was like the, it was the last day of the of the summer shoot, and uh, we all knew each other and were very comfortable with each other by that point. Well, that's Ryan Murphy's directing style. How would you describe your directing style? Well, it is. I mean, it basically is that. I like to I like to sit and watch for a while and see what develops. Um, um, I like people to go full out. I, I mean, I don't mean opening night performance, and I don't mean, I don't mean striving for perfection, but I like people to try things and like kind of be monsters, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the best sense, yeah. like to really throw down. Um, Cause that's, because I think that's when the best things start to occur. Um, I don't know, a, a timid actor, I understand that there are other ways of approaching it and that there are, there's a kind of a, there's a way in which you can build it very slowly, layer by layer, and I think that's a, <clears throat> uh, an absolutely um, valid way of working. It's just never, I don't know, it's just never been part of my metabolism. Do you have, when you have an actor like that in one of your casts, do you take them aside and talk about what you would like to see from them? Um, in early days? No, I don't do that. Um, I would say, I would just try to encourage them to take chances and to kind of relieve them. I think quite often what it is is, is, is just fear, fear of being wrong, you know? And I feel like we've got four weeks to just be really wrong. I mean, I love it when people are really wrong. Because, it, <laughs> because then I think you start to understand the boundaries of the thing. Yeah. Um, so no, I'm not afraid, and so, and I think actors trust me because I say, I'm not afraid to say I don't know. You know what I mean? So I think they know that we're all kind of making this thing together, and that their contribution is valuable and essential. Do you think that comes from you having spent so many years as an actor? No, I think it's just ex experience of doing it, yeah. Well, going back to the normal part, you came to New York City in the mid-80s, right? So were you drawing on your time in the city at that time? I did. I, I was, uh, <clears throat> when I came to the city, uh, I, uh, I saw the original production and, uh, at the public, and um, it just was, just, I was kind of shattered by it. I went and saw it by myself. And then shortly thereafter, I uh, went through training to become a... Um, I guess we were called buddies um, at the time. I don't know if they still. And so we would have, you were broken up by different neighborhoods. And I lived on the Upper West Side. And we would have a monthly meeting, and then you were assigned um, this person that you would interact with. And it could be anything from running errands to going and visiting them in their homes or quite often visiting them in the hospital. And um, I remember at the time visiting this one guy. and. Uh, we worked together for a few months, and uh, it was at the time where the um, food service um, people were not required to go into the rooms, and so we have to go into the. I mean, it's sort of just there's a scene in the movie that's yeah. like that. And, um, you know, it was a really, it was a, it was terrifying. It was a terrifying time. So yes. Um, 
No, that's one of the moments, the scene that you're talking about in the hospital when um, a man dying of AIDS, no one will bring his food into the room with him and no one will go into the room to fix his TV is one of the best things about seeing that play adapted to film because you get a really visceral sense of what it was like at that time that you didn't necessarily get in the play in that same way. Yeah. But um, you also originated Lewis in Angels of America on Broadway. Yeah. So were there things from that from that work that you took with you to do the, both versions of The Normal Heart? It's so long ago. I mean, truly, it's so long ago. And, it, and, it, and it's like, you know, when I talk about, when I talk about acting, um, it's, it's like through this fog of this, 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 this phantom person who used to exist who doesn't exist anymore. So it's, a, it's really, really difficult to, to, to kind of remember. I think, I, I'll tell you what, the, the, doing the play The Normal Heart, it did allow me to kind of go back and rectify um, the kind of the way, the way that I, I guess the way that I did work, which was that I would watch myself, and I think I was a timid actor. Um, and when we did the play The Normal Heart, I basically thought, well, fuck it. I mean, what's the worst they can say? I mean, I'm the director. And uh, it was very liberating. It was really liberating every night to go out there and just kind of go for it. Um, and I think I was much more in my head around the time of Angels. How did they lure you back on stage with the normal heart? Because it sounds like you have closed the book on being an actor. Yeah, I mean, I really, I, I really had given it up, and it was the the, the uh, Ned Weeks because of this experience, this seminal experience I had seeing the play at the public. It was the only role that I had ever wanted to play, and so I never really missed acting, but I really regretted the fact that I never got to play this 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 part. Um, and I ran into um, Joel Gray at the theater one night, and he said, "What are you?" Uh, I said, "What are you doing?" And he said, oh, I'm, "I'm about to direct this." Um, reading of the normal heart for a benefit, and I said, "Oh God, that's the only part I've ever wanted to play. Just you know, shooting and shit." And he said, "Well, come do it." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "What are the dates?" <laughs> um, and so it really was. It was. It was. Uh, it was. It was. It was that. It was like this miraculous opportunity occurred to get to do this thing that I always wanted to do, and it wasn't anything more than. What convinced you to, when they said we want to take this to Broadway and you only have two weeks of rehearsal, how much how much time passed before you said yes? Um, I said no for a very long time, <laughs> and then um, uh, Larry Larry uh, uh, made a very compelling case. Um, and when we were going to do it on Broadway, the idea was that we were essentially going to remount it and do it like a stage reading with script in hand. Hence the two-week rehearsal, <laughs> um, and then um, uh, George Wolf came on to help us. And it was still up until until we moved into the theater, there was really no definitive, you know, decision about whether we were going to hold scripts or not. <laughs> <laughs> when did that decision get made? <laughs> when I put my script down. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know, I think we were all gonna try, but you know, we all sort of felt like, wait, we've been b bamboozled. We thought this was a reading, and now you're selling tickets for a lot of money, and there's, wait, there's a set, and... <laughs> and George is, is, is a, a incredible and a genius, and he, and he instills uh, you know, you feel really, really brave when you're with George. And he never made a big deal about it. And and then one day we just did a run through without them. And then I called him that night and I said, "But you know, I'm I'm still I'm still probably going to hold the script." I like, so. you could have just had index cards hidden all over that set. Just walking up to a wall, staring at a wall, delivering a monologue. I mean, the, the, until the end of the run, there were there were sections where before I'd go on, I would have to just refresh my memory. <coughs>
Are you good at memorizing? Um, I guess, you know, just because uh, you've done these two Fear and roles. vanity are great motivators. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it's hard to answer. I've never, you know. Um, but I want to go back to something you said about the normal heart taking off that chunk of time, because you've directed plays that have moved from off-Broadway to Broadway months with months passing in between. Yeah. When you have that gap, does that deepen the work for you? I think any time, you know, an actor, you know, all of you that are actors out here, you know, that if, you, if you've ever played a part and you get to play it again, a year later or several years later, something happens because I think once it goes into the computer, you continue to think about it even in even you know in, in, unconsciously, and so um, so yes, it does deepen. It gets more layered. It gets more textured, and it gets the the effort falls away or starts to. When does the computer turn off for you? Because you direct multiple shows. Well, I'm just talking about actors. I'm talking uh, about, you know, that, that I think that actors, I've seen it happen where we've done a production and we, we've come back to it. And something about it, it just becomes, it just becomes organic in, in, in their bodies. But what about you as a director? When you start remounting a play that you've done just a few months ago, are you questioning choices you made? Are you tweaking things. Yeah, I mean, I think a thing is living all the time, and so you're constantly looking at the thing every night and trying to make it better, trying to make it sharper, trying to make it more interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. And on that subject, I want to uh, talk about Wicked very briefly. Um, how often do you go back in and put the actors through their paces? Um, well, uh, let's see, how to answer that. There's an extraordinary team of people. Um, I. Uh, I've never had anything, any production sort of take off like Wicked. I don't think that many people do. It's sort of this phenomenon. And so you learn that there's a, there, so a system has to get into place to keep that machine running every night. And there's an extraordinary group of people who really, really are responsible for making that thing run 10 years into it. I go, um, I cast, I'm involved in casting all of the principals for Broadway, um, London, and the tours. Um, um, and but uh, and then I see each production maybe a couple times a year. Well, do you ten years in? Are you do you watch it and do you think oh, I wish I'd done this differently? Or oh yeah, we just changed it? something <laughs> several months ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What did you change? It was just little little things here and there. There was there was there's a section in the show that has always bothered me, and I always look down when it when it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell you what it is. Uh, uh, well, there's two sections. One we can't do anything about, but in this one particular section, I look at it over the years and I just think, oh, that's just, it looks like an ass. It's just terrible. <laughs> and uh, so we got to fix it and put it into a few of the companies. It involves some sort of um, stunty kind of thing. So, but, um, so we're constantly changing it. I mean, we, we were fortunate enough to really make major changes between Broadway and uh, when we did, when we when we went to London to do it, we worked on it. We were over there for like ten weeks, and we really did a major revamp of the of the show, the staging, you know, like little subtle things, but but we made it better, I think. Well, yeah, when it went on tour, did you have to revamp a lot just to fit the different theaters to make it fit into all of those theaters? A little bit, a little bit, but we tried to, you know, our producers were pretty committed to um, really deliver the experience that people would get on Broadway. Yeah. So. Well, when you're auditioning the principals, or when you're auditioning anyone, what, uh, how do you run the audition room? <laughs> I do this thing. Has anyone here ever auditioned for me? <laughs> so, you know, like I come to, I, I meet people at the door. Yeah. Uh, just because I've been there, and it's horrible. It's like you're walking into a firing squad, and no one's <laughs> looking at you, and no one is... You know, and you so you just feel like this insane person that's walking in. Like it's like walking into a party, and no one acknowledges that you're there. So I greet people at the door. Which quite often, people walk right by me. <laughs> and, uh, it's okay. Uh, and uh, so I tr just try to have a moment to connect with the actor and like look in their eyes, like it's going to be okay. Uh, and then I. The other weird thing about me is that I don't sit at the table. I, like if this was the audition room, oh, is there a camera? Um, I stand like this. 
Uh, I'm in the corner, and I'm usually bunched up, and like a flasher lurking in the it's corner. Weird. It's weird. It's vaguely stalkerish. And, uh, and, uh, and then I kind of do that, and, and, and then, and to the frustration of many of my collaborators, I, when the actor's done, if we're going to see more, I, I walk over to them, and then I pull them into another corner and whisper. And I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to find. It's, it's just you know, you've all done it. It's horrible. And but you know, I try to find a bit of humanity and a bit of like, okay, let's look in each other's eyes for a second and see: are we are, are we saying are we work? Do we see this the same way? It's not just about what about your take on it. It's like we're going to have to make this thing together. If, if, if I say something to you, does that make sense to you? If, when you respond, does that make sense to me? Um, because those are the more important questions. I feel like, you know, it, it, one of the great mysteries of the, of, of, the, of the audition room is, I don't know if any of you have ever done it, but I would encourage you to do it, is get in there and be a reader. Mm. It's better than drama school. <laughs> it's better than that. It's the greatest education you've ever because you really see people come in and how they get the job. And you also see extraordinary, talented, brave, funny, smart, incredible actors come in and blow everybody away and they don't get a call back. Mm -hmm. And so in so many ways, it's out of your hands. And so what I really like, and I think what often wins the day, is when people come in and they just bring their best self. And they just say, this is what I would do with it. This is my first take on it. And they show you the best of them and then they walk, and they're not, they're not trying to second guess what we want. They're, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing. It's, you, the, 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 the people say it, and it's true. The, the, the cast chooses itself. When those people come in and they're not right for the part, but they do blow you away, do you remember them and call them back in for future projects? Mm -hmm. I've written letters. I've, I've written letters and said to people, "You were amazing. You're extraordinary. This isn't this isn't the one." But I, you know, um, uh, Justin Kirk, who was in Love, Valor, Compassion, he auditioned for a play that I did, and I wrote him a fan letter. I was like, "You blew me away." You're not the guy for this part, but we will work together again. So when an actor doesn't get cast, who feels worse, the actor or you? <laughs> um, I mean, I have sympathetic nausea for actors when they walk in. I, at the end of the day, I'm like, uh, I'm like, a, 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 I'm so tense because I want because I know how much I I remember how much work goes into it and how much you want the part. And I want it to be a good experience, and I want it to be a dignified experience. Um, what was your audition technique like back in the dark days when you were acting? Not existent. Not existent. No, truly. I mean, it's, I think it's. I think it's why I feel so um, so tense because I just I was terrible at it. The only good audition I ever gave was Angels in America, only because I knew in some way, like it's now or never. You have to do this, and I was really good, but that was it. What would, would you just show up and mumble through your lines? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what I did. I mean, I never got called back. I was unhirable. <laughs> Do you think all those casting directors saw Angels in America and went, what? What the, where the hell did that come from? Well, but some of them did come in and uh, come backstage and they were like, all of a sudden I was their new friend. And I was like, you never... Yeah, no. and I really, I really, I didn't work for a very, 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 very long time. So after Angels in America, at what point did you say, you know, I'm just going to hang this up and I'm going to get into directing? Um, it wasn't that kind of a conscious decision. It, 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 it was kind of, um, it, it, the segue was pretty fluid and uh, I, I was a member of um, a theater company uh, that um, unfortunately no longer exists called the Circle Repertory Company. Amazing. And they were really responsible for pushing me and, and encouraging me and, 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 and helping me discover that I wanted to be a director. Um, and so it's, that was kind of happening simultaneously. And um, then I started getting um, uh, 
directing jobs, little directing jobs. And uh, I also think that I had an, a, an awareness that in terms of doing a play, um, it was probably not gonna get better than Angels in America. And so I thought like, well, that's a good one to go out on, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's, you know. Well, what point in your mind did you turn from being an actor who directs into a director who used to be an actor? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, because for a very long time, I, I did give myself the out. I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really a director. So, and um, I don't know when it was. Maybe, uh, maybe when I started working with Terrence McNally, I think he was the one that really, um, he sort of mentored me about a life in the theater. Yeah. What was that relationship like? Because you two are extremely simpatico. Well, you know, he's amazing. And, and God bless Terrence McNally and all of the people like Terrence McNally who um, really took a chance on me when I had absolutely no or very few credits. And they'd lost um, their director for Love, Valor, Compassion at um, um, Manhattan Theater Club. And he met with a lot of people, and all much more experienced and well-known than I was. And um, he liked me, you know? I think he liked my, um, that I wasn't daunted by the play. Um, and he said, I'm gonna go with you. And it changed my life. And I don't know. I, I think I think he's such a man of the theater, and he, he he's such a craftsman. But he also follows his instincts, and it was an extraordinary um, experience. And as have been all of our collaborations. And you directed the film adaptation as well, didn't you? I did. Yes. Was that? Did you just jump into that, or were you? Did you have to be talked into it? No, I mean, he said, I'll, I'm going to make it a condition of selling the, the, prop, the play that you directed. Oh, wow. And, and I just said, oh, OK. And uh, <laughs> just because I, you know, I never, I'm one of those people that thinks, like, we'll just say yes, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and uh, so it did happen. And I want to talk about a little bit about, because um, we're talking about the cast chooses itself. Um, and then going back to you directing several plays that moved off Broadway to Broadway, one of those was Other Desert Cities, which was superlative. <laughs> but what I found fascinating is that with the changing of two cast members, it almost felt like a different play. It did, it did. Yeah. It did, oh, yeah. for me, yes. Uh -huh. And so what, when you realized that you had to replace two cast members, did that affect, and you got into the rehearsal room, did you change your direction? Were you finding new ways to uh, get the all of them to gel as an ensemble? Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was. I mean, I looked at it as like a, it was a it was kind of a an extraordinary opportunity because we knew that the play worked on some level. It was it was kind of you know it seemed to be working for a portion of the a large portion of the audience, and then we had these two new pieces that I mean it, it is the, it's it's the it's the it's the challenge of having replacements, which we face on Wicked all the time, is that you want to give the actors enough room and enough breath to to, to find their own way, and yet there is a, there is a kind of a pre-existing structure that has to be honored uh, um, and adhered to. But I don't know. I mean, it it, it, it kind of both the new actors were. People who came in again with ideas and and were open to exploring, you know, what had been done before, just in terms of the staging. But we changed things. And were those two auditions or offers? Uh, they were both offers. Mm -hmm. Are you nervous when you don't audition people? I tend to be nervous, and only not because it's not an ego thing. It's again, it goes back to being in the room, and you know, there have been times where I've been in the room. You know, that an actor, you have to make sure you're in sync. So I don't know. It's it's a it's a it's a very flawed system, and so I tend to work with a lot of the people over and over and over again. Um, but and we're also getting we we start we started living in this world where auditioning is is is, is you know like you, you, you god forbid you should ask someone to come in and audition they keep saying well they'll uh, 
they'll, co they'll come and have coffee with you. I said, well, that's just going to tell me whether we like having coffee together. It has nothing to do with being in a play. Um, um, so it's a, it's a tricky one, you know. You, no, I've talked to so many actors who would, as much as they hate auditioning, would rather be in the room with the director to know that they have the same vision yeah. and not show up on set and have a completely different take and a Cuban accent. Yeah. <laughs> Which is totally but I also, I mean, I actually, honestly, I look at it as an opportunity for there to be an exchange of ideas so that we can, so that by the time, you know, so on day one, you don't show up and I'm saying A and you're saying Z and we see it completely differently. I mean, they, mo they, they, they can both be valid ways of approaching the character, but... You know. Well, there are actors who come in and make you see it Z instead of A. Sure, yeah, yeah. And uh, do you let them know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm really not dogmatic in terms of the way that it has to be, but uh, I'm not particularly dogmatic. I mean, I have, my, I have ideas, so it's not like I'm just this blank slate, but... Um, I don't know. It's case to case, it's very, very different. I don't have a way of working. Yeah. Well, case to case, what what makes you say yes to taking on a project? Mm, right now in my life, whether I'm going to learn uh, from the people that I'm in the room with. And so you are just hoping that actors are going to teach you. Um, th I mean, this has more to do with this, the project itself yeah. and, and my, my collaborators on that. But it can have something to do with the actors, yeah. And then you were saying that you weren't daunted by love, valor, compassion. Are you often daunted by scripts? I'm not daunted, but I do feel like there are things that I do well or there, there are contributions that I can make that can help elevate or... Uh, enhance the material, and then there are, there are great plays that I've read, and I think, I have no idea, there are people out there who would do this so much better than I would. What do you think your strengths are as a director? Other I, than... I think I'm a really, uh, I think I'm a, an excellent dramaturg. I've done a lot of new plays, and I think I, I have this kind of amazing ability to, like, I can cut and paste in my head really, really quickly, and so I can move stuff around so that, and, sh and shape a scene really quickly. So is that why you have that recurring relationship with a lot of playwrights, because you have that sense of trust? I, I mean, I would hope so. I would hope that to be true, yes. But I think it's, um, and I think I tend to really thrive on um, developing the material. I think I'm, I'm at my best at that point. Well, we were talking to the green room before we came out here about The Last Ship the musical that's coming to Broadway that Joe just directed. Yeah. When it comes to a big musical like that, what, how, do you, how do you tackle with that many collaborators the project? Um, you know, it's always the same, whether the person is Sting or, you know, so, I mean, you have to roll up your sleeves and you have to, with a musical, and, you know, and the material has to sort of argue for its life. You know, in, in the case of The Last Ship, when I came, uh, onto the project, there was this three-hour version that was fantastic, but there was just too much great stuff. And so our 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 um, process on it was really about whittling it down and editing and refining and clarifying the story. Um, and that and you know that's in every department. Was that before the cast was set? The whittling down. Um, some of them had done a workshop that, that, that I saw. So when you whittle stuff down and an actor loses like a scene or a song, how do you approach telling them that? Sensitively. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on the actor. I mean, some, some actors, I mean, I, I feel like most actors are really smart and though it stings, they really, they, they, most understand. I mean, we, we we actually did make some pretty extensive cuts in in, um, in Chicago on Last Ship, and the actors were incredible. They're like, I totally get it. I totally get it. What is the rehearsal process like for you with a giant musical like that? Because we've talked a lot about the smaller plays that you've done. Um, well, those of you who are here who've done musicals, you know, there's usually like two or three rooms going at the same time. 
there's usually a smaller room where people are being taught the music. There's usually a room where the choreographer is working with the actors on the numbers, and then there's usually another room where I'm doing scenes. And then during the day, uh, you know, there's lots of overlapping. And um, with Last Ship, because uh, my my uh, the choreographer on on Last Ship is a man named Stephen Hoggett, he's a genius, and um, and so we we tend to be in each other's rehearsals, and because we wanted a kind of a a seamless transition from the scenes to the musical numbers. At what point, maybe not on the last ship, but at what point in other musicals do you get involved with the choreography and all of that? Are you keeping an eye on that to keep it a seamless transition from book scene to the I mean, musical I number? try to give them a little bit of, I try to give them, you know, room to do a draft of it and I'll pop my head in and look and see if what they're doing and, you know, but I, I mean, I. People are there because they're talented and, and they should be there. And so, I mean, I tend to trust my collaborators to, to at least do a draft of like, let me see what's in their head and then sit down and talk with them and go from there. Well, when you have so many actors coming in because you work constantly, as we were talking about earlier, what do you wish that every actor knew when they come into your audition room? Well, I mean, I sort of said it. Um, I want to go home, so I want you to be good. <laughs> I mean, I want you to be the right. I want you to be the right person. I'm not. I, I'm not sitting there like this. I, I'm not a prove it to me, uh, yeah. a director. I really. I, I. I. feel like I'm. I'm. I'm open to every single person who walks in being the right person. But I would say, I'm repeating myself. But I would say, don't try to second guess what it is. Just. Just be you. Be the be the best version of you. More often than not, that that's the thing that gets you the job. Well, that going all out does that apply to table reads too? Do you want everyone to go full out, sitting around and reading the script through? Yeah. What I mean is, I, I don't like this kind of stuff where people are just reading like this. And just, <laughs> I don't know what that is. I don't understand that. Um, so I don't mean you know, I don't mean giving a, a, a just a big performance for the sake of giving a big performance I'm saying like make like have a have a have a take on the scene well yeah that makes sense well it's right I mean you, you have to, <laughs> you'd be surprised I mean yes this is all pretty common sense yeah yeah um, is there anything that you take from your time as an actor other than the audition horrors that you take into the room with you when you're directing I just try to remember that people are, you know, that it's a, it's a, I think you all are very brave and uh, courageous people to expose yourself that way and that sometimes need to be handled carefully, you know. Were you an actor who needed to be handled carefully? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In what way? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think I was, I think I was neurotic. I was really neurotic. So because my, I, because I think part, when I look back on it, I think the 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 the, the nascent director part of my brain was or, was was in motion already. Although I didn't know what to call that voice, and that that part of my brain was kind of watching the scene and and particularly watching me in the scene, and so it felt. Um, constipated sometimes because I was so busy watching. Well, the flip to that question is now that you have gone back to acting, however briefly, please come back because you are really stupendous. Oh, thank you. Um, what do you take from being a director as you're being an actor? Well, it, that, and that's what I meant when I said going back and doing the play and then doing the film was that I had none of that. I was not, I, I, I didn't feel self-conscious in the least. And maybe it's all about labels and how we define ourselves in the world. And because I don't define myself as an actor, I can be any kind of an actor, you know what I mean? <laughs> my, my identity is not wrapped up in being an actor. And so it was really liberating. Well, then we're out of time, but one more question. What advice would you have for actors who are thinking about becoming directors? 
other than find Terrence McNally? I think you know. I really think you know. And if if you uh, if if you have the impulse and you dabble in it and it, and, it, and, you, and you flee, you're not a director. I, I think there it, there's something in our DNA that emerges at some point, and you know. But I have I have a good friend uh, who's an actress an actor, but and uh, and she sort of like me said, I want I think I want to try this, and she was really good at it. And I watched her become this wonderful director that was always there. And I'd worked with her before, and I could sort of see the, a glimmer of it in her eyes because of the way that she would talk about scenes and the way that she would talk about productions. And, and she just knew. I think she knew when she you know, gingerly put her toe in the water. And, but now she's doing it. So was it a relief when you started directing? felt like I was home. Yeah. Well, I can't think of a better note to end on than that. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to Joe and Kelly.